Get your business together. Get yourself into what you do and see it through. Being boss is hard. Blending work and life is messy. Making a dream job of your own isn't easy. But getting paid for it, becoming known for it, and finding purpose in it is so doable. If you do the work. Being Boss is a podcast for creative entrepreneurs, brought to you by Emily Thompson and Kathleen Shannon. Hi, I'm Emily, and I own Indie Shopography, where I help passionate entrepreneurs establish and grow their business online by helping them build brands that attract and websites that sell. I help my clients launch their business so they can do more of what they love and make money doing it. And I'm Kathleen. I'm the co-owner of Brave Creative, where I specialize in branding and business visioning for creative entrepreneurs who want to blend who they are with what they do, narrow in on their core genius, and shape their content so they can position themselves as experts to attract more dream clients. And Being Boss is a podcast where we're talking shop, giving you a peek behind the scenes of what it takes to build a business, interviewing other working creatives, and figuring it out as we go right there with you. Check out our archives at lovebeingboss.com. Welcome to episode number 33. This episode is brought to you by FreshBooks Cloud Accounting. Today's episode is for the working moms, mom-to-bees, and the mamapreneurs. We're bringing in postpartum health expert Rebecca Egbert to join the conversation. So if you're a mom and a boss or aspiring to be a mom and or a boss, you won't want to miss this one. If you're building a business and feeling scattered or unorganized when it comes to managing your money, billing your clients, and tracking your expenses, trust us, you're not alone. And that's where FreshBooks comes in. FreshBooks is there to help you run your business and make you look like a pro while doing it. There's no reason you should be waiting weeks for payments, collecting your receipts in a shoebox, or pulling your hair out over software not built for small independent business owners. FreshBooks is a solution for managing your business's finances in today's world. One of our favorite FreshBooks features lately is that you can automatically import all your expenses directly from your bank account, and it's super easy to organize those expenses into tax-friendly categories. It makes doing quarterly and yearly taxes a breeze, even if you're not so money-minded. Try FreshBooks free today. Go to freshbooks.com slash beingboss and select being boss in the how did you hear about us section. Okay, you guys. So today we're talking about being a mom and being a boss. And um, for me, being a new mom and growing my business at the same time is, well, it hasn't been easy. But I'm not sure I'd want it any other way. Um And it's so important as a new mom and as a business owner to take care of ourselves mentally, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. And that's what we're talking about today, being boss and being mom and making sure that you don't lose your mind. Uh, I'm not sure I'm doing a great job, but whatever. (laughs) So we've brought in postpartum health expert Rebecca Egbert to join the conversation. Hey, Rebecca. Hello. Hi. Thanks for having me, guys. <laughs> yeah, of course. And a full disclosure, Rebecca is a Indie Boom and Braid Creative client, mm-hmm. so we've worked together. Um, I also hired Rebecca for coaching shortly after I had my little babe. So we thought that she would be the perfect person to bring on because um, not only is she an expert, but she's a friend and we're used to kind of just jamming with her. <laughs> I might get off track a little bit, but that's normal. It's that's, a, that's what podcast <laughs> yeah. is all about. We do it every time. Um, so yeah, we uh, the episode we did, I guess, two times ago was um, which that one came out this week. Recording early always has my brain just all kinds of fuzzy. I never know what's happening. But uh, so I guess the one at this point will be two weeks ago. Um, we had answered a couple of questions from listeners who um, who are new moms or want to be moms um, and want to juggle a business. And in our Facebook group, this is something that uh, people talk about a lot. We are for guys and girls, but we attract lots of ladies, and lots of ladies have babies. Um, so we just, yeah, I want to chat with you today about how to do this business thing while juggling, like, being a new mom or an old mom. <laughs> Yeah. And how to make it all work. And you know, I think, I think guys should be listening to this episode too, especially if you are, uh, 
partnered with a woman who is a mom and a yeah. boss. So basically, I'm talking to you, Jeremy. <laughs> Are you in the room, Jeremy? Are you making oatmeal? <laughs> <laughs> he is not. He's at work. Okay. Um, all right. So, so okay. The, the first thing I want to really touch on whenever it comes to being a mom and a boss is getting in your right mind. Because I also feel, I, I feel like I'm losing my mind a little bit. So what do you guys do to get in your right mind? <laughs> I like to sleep, Kathleen. <laughs> I know that's a touchy subject. I feel so bad. Like, I feel like I'm constantly talking about sleep, and especially Rebecca got the brunt of it because, like, I was probably pretty much uncoachable because I was not sleeping whenever we were working together. And um, it's, it's so funny because Fox has gone through a regression in the past two nights. Yeah. And it's like p- uh, PTSD. I'm it's just painful. like. Mm-hmm. Uh, I can't yeah. do, do it again. Anyway. You know, so losing sleep is, uh, it's such a tender subject for me. Peer- I know. Thing. <laughs> it's, such <a> t- <laughs> it's such a tender subject for me. And um, uh, because I lost so much sleep as a midwife and I have, I reflect on it time and time again after work, like when I'm working with my moms, when I hear you say that a year after finishing up our work together, you know, and like you're still struggling to get that sleep in. And I think about my space and time, and this is what so many women are going to experience, especially if you have a baby, then, you know, wait two years and have another baby or whatever, and you're a working mom, is that you're just never going to get enough sleep. And so you're just not going to be able to build your restore, your, like your, you know, your stores, your energy stores, or or like refurbish them, as I would like to say. Um, and, and, and all I can say is that it, it sucks and it blows and it's so hard because sleep, like you just said, Emily is like number one. Right. And I'm right now working these like 16 hour days and my friend Maggie and I were going back and forth in text the other day and she's just like, yeah, way to go. You know, like you're being boss. And I was like, yeah, but sleep is like my thing <laughs> Like after losing so much. And I love people like Gary Vaynerchuk, but I wonder, like I have these big question marks about like the push 18 hours, lose sleep. When you're a new mom, though, you have no choice, right? Like, you're waking up in the middle of the night, and that is hard, period. I can't, I don't want, I won't go too far into the physiology of, like, waking up and going to sleep and waking up and going to sleep and what it does to our rhythms, but over time, the more sleep you lose, you know, it's almost like, uh, well, eating, like, cookies, like, eating a lot of sugar when you're exhausted, you know, it just keeps building up and turns into, like, fluff (laughs) or, you know, extra skin on our bodies, that kind of stuff. And it, what it takes is like years and years and years of constant sleep. And so as you grow older as a mom, is what I say, you will start gaining more sleep like you, Emily, and feeling better and more revived. But these early two, like anywhere two and under, it, it's really hard to achieve whole sleep, good sleep. All right. Can I tell you guys why I'm pissed? <laughs> yes. By all means. Like, here's why I'm mad. <laughs> I want to know. I wish I could help, well, but I can't. Well, it makes me so angry. And I guess, like, I feel like, especially today, it's just been kind of a rough couple of nights. And I I feel like it's unfair that I'm in my prime. I'm in my prime of life and childbearing age and growing my business. Like, why does it all have to happen at the same time? Like, why can't I be physically able to just have a baby whenever I'm like, I don't know, 80? (laughs) Because why would you want to do that? Exactly. (laughs) Because your uterus might come out with me. Um, <laughs> sorry, that's a little bit. Um, I'm glad you're pissed. Yeah. Well, and, and I think this is just like, I, I think you answered it. Like, you are at your prime. If there is any time in your life that you are going to be capable of doing all those things, it's right now. So, do it. Like, you're in the best physical shape of your life. or You know, the best, like family oriented shape more or less hopefully (laughs) of your life like you are at your prime and that's why you can do all these things and that's why you have all of them and like you always say this just will not last forever (laughs) like things will either there will be some things that will become easier and some things that become harder but at the moment I think everything probably is at a good not peak to think because things will get better but you're doing a lot right now, and it's because you can. 
All right. So for all the moms or um, moms to be that are listening to this episode, sleep, if that's not an option, what are some other ways that you can get in your right mind and not go crazy being a mom and a boss? Yeah. So I'm totally, obviously a huge proponent of meditation. Anyone that ha- reads any of my blog posts or gets my newsletter, it's like, num- it's always in there. And um, I came out of midwifery. So, you know, not having kids myself, like um, I, my sleep deprivation came from just being up all night over and over and over again. Like you don't, you get little pockets of sleep. It's even kind of, you know, it's, it's crazy. <laughs> it's crazy you making really. babies are born between Oh, and five. <laughs> they love to come between 11 and like five <laughs> in the morning, night to morning. And it's, so it's just, it makes like, I remember getting called and being so excited to go to a birth, but yet feeling nauseous the whole time, you know, just cause you're so tired. Yeah. Um, that, that piece pisses me off too. Cause you're like, <sighs> excuse my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> so meditation is one in what I have, I, as tired as I am, make, five to 20 minute practice day to day, you know, like every day. And with doing that now for two years, I can look back at who I was two years ago and look at myself now. And I've really been hitting this hard energetically lately because I'm using a lot of energy and um, it's impressive because I'm also uh, relating my mood to the time I take to meditate. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and so it's making me a happier person. It's making me a more productive person. It's making me say, oh, wow, I only get five hours of sleep tonight. What am I going to do today? You know, so it's like it's, it's I guess, accepting is the kind of controversial word, <laughs> but it's the truth of this. Um, I feel good. I feel energized. I feel um, knowing I'm going to be okay today. Does that make, that make sense? Yeah. How would you recommend if someone is new to meditation – starting that practice? Um, I, I'm like a huge Headspace fan. And now I just, I use it enough that I just start, like I get all these coupons and I'll just forward it off to whomever comes into my mind first and be like, here's your discount. If you're not using it, you know, here's your, I don't get anything from it from anybody. I should get like stock in the company, but, um, I don't get anything from it. You know, um, I really think it's for me, I, again, I've been meditating for around 20 years and my first practice was more of a yogic practice. And, um, and just a silent meditation and they're visual meditations more or less. And that for me, I'm a very creative, active mind. And that just like brings me to the center line that like draws right between my body and says, okay, even if I'm emotional, I, it still says, okay, I'm good. You know, like I, I got, I got this, It's my little state farm insurance commercial. Um, but you know, so that's one yin yoga has become my best friend too. I've really picked up these practices, uh, since I've, quit delivering babies that are all nervous system based psychosomatic based practices that really say brain. Okay. I want you to feel this way. I want you to behave this way. And and then I want you to go into my body and help my body be centered, mellow, happy, you know, like whatever joy, like filled, whatever kind of emotions I want to feel. So our brain has to be organized first before our body responds to it. All right, let's talk more about that. Um, <laughs> how do we get our brain organized? Is it just Kathleen has this look of want on her face I know. right now? It's amazing. Uh, okay, tell me more. <laughs> this is why Kathleen and I had such a blast working together. I have to say, um, she pulls something out in me. I like to just go there with her. Um, so, my story. So when I was um, about twenty. Uh, I think probably two. So this was like 1996. I, uh, I had had a traumatic event when I was 19 years old and it just changed everything. I was, went from being hardcore pre-med to going to an experiential education college where my degree ended up being outdoor experiential education and holistic health and alternative healing. So that's so total hippie. You went from pre-med to hippie degree. I went from preppy ass banana Republic wearing awesome clothes to like, Let's get rid of all that stuff. My mom and I have been talking about this a lot. (laughs) (laughs) And, um, and it was great. It was the nineties. It was like totally fun to be a hippie in the nineties. And, um, and then I started seeing it. I started training to do my Reiki master. And then I started to, um, also go to therapy with my teacher. 
And, um, and so she w- did psychosomatic healing is what she called it. So it was therapy, but you laid on the floor and you talked through your issues with your eyes closed. And she would, when you would find like a block a like a, you know, you would scan your body. So this is a lot what you do in the Headspace app too. Every time you start, he has you scan your body and feel where your energy might, you might have pain in your back. He does, he's very like man, like man, woman, like he's really neutral. Does that mean, I mean, I don't know why I said man, woman, but like he's really neutral. He doesn't go woo woo. And um, so that's, so that was one of the first like ther- therapy sessions I really experienced healing from because we would talk about what was going on for me emotionally. And yet she would always say, okay, where does it live in your body? What does it feel like? What does it look like? What color does it have? You know, does it have any sensations with it? And so these are all mindfulness-based practices. Flip forward 20 years later, we have all this research on like mindfulness-based meditation. You know, like we have Walter Reed, which is a major medical hospital doing all this research on how it helps with, you know, soldiers coming back from Iraq and Iran and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And so now we just know about it so much more, which is awesome because there's that consciousness shift. But to go back to it, you have to do, you have to say, man, there's this dark spot in my lower back and it just won't go away. And then the provider can say, let's talk about that. Like, you know, is there, what does it feel like? So if you don't have color, let's say like, so a gray area, if you don't, then you can say, what does it feel like? So to apply this to sleep, you know, if I was awake after having to get up and breastfeed or having to do a regression night or any of that kind of stuff, when, because what's really happening in that baby is that they're growing and they might be growing cellularly. I'm really going there. Right now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they might be, <laughs> they might be growing physically or emotionally, or, you know, even their brain is growing and developing. We all know that. Right. So with all their changes, you know, all they want is your nourishment or all that connection, that stuff that makes them feel safe. Oh, now I feel like an asshole. <laughs> no, you're not. I no. was so mad. I was like, why are you waking up? I'm giving you everything you need. Why are you still crying? Like, just mad. And now I'm like, oh, oh he's already <laughs> was just growing his brain. Growing it's like you're growing it's, yours it's, too now, Kathleen. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you, Emily. Sorry, I'm sorry, Rebecca. Keep going. No, it's fine. So babies are growing. They're trying to get their nourishment from their you're, angry moms in the middle so, of the night. <laughs> so, and you, uh, for me, I would go back into bed if I had that pissed offness and take some deep breaths and say, and this is like an actionable tool. Take some deep breaths and say, okay, where in my body am I really pissed off? you know, and why is it just because I'm losing sleep or is, is it because I have two podcasts due next tomorrow and, you know, three clients like final meetings yes. and like all that kind of stuff. Yes. Like <laughs> the load is so much bigger than I can handle. And I just want to be fresh for that. So then you're like, okay, that's, and now it's living in my diaphragm. No wonder I can't breathe properly. You know what I'm saying? And then what does it feel like? And then you just breathe energy into it and you sit with it. And you can you know, and, and that again is, it's really great if you can find literally they're called, what was she called? Oh, she, her therapy was called Hakomi, H O K O M I therapy. And if you can find providers that do this or it, you know, and check them out. They're great. Psychosomatic. If you can find it. So I'm actually going to an energy doctor next Friday and I feel Mm -hmm. like it's something that you would be proud of Rebecca, (laughs) like something that you would tell me. (laughs) Um, but it's funny because you and I worked together for a while and I'm now working with my very first executive coach that I worked with right when I started braid. And, um, I was kind of talking to him a little bit, catching him up and he was like, I think you need to go get some energy cleared. Nice. (laughs) And so just because of, um, kind of that trauma from that first year, probably not only just the sleep thing, but even just physically, birthing a baby is a oh. huge shift in your body. Yeah. And totally. something else that gave me a lot of comfort whenever we work together, um, is how you told me it takes what three years for your body to really fully heal. And so I think about that whenever I want to go hard with, um, boxing or with whatever workouts that I'm doing, or I'm not being so gentle with myself I just have to remember, I, I think about all of your talk about the nervous system, 
and how it's still kind of out of whack and even your whole body in general. And I mean, my pelvic floor is still a wreck. Yeah. Jumping okay. jacks. Uh-uh. I know. See, I'm telling you, if I was in your town, we'd be working you differently. I just need to, I'm going to start doing traveling workshops where I just go work with people eventually. And, you know, like we're going to just do workouts that are related to the pelvic floor that you can do at home and stuff like that. That's like on the bucket list for the future. Um, yeah. And it, uh, it's the body we don't put a lot of emphasis on in medicine. Um, cellular slash energetic slash woo woo slash whatever. But like what I love is here we go, Deepak Chopra, you know, like all these big Dr. Oz, like all these people, uh, Lisa Rankin, you know, uh, Tia Rona Lodog, like there's all these uh, holistic providers out there that are MDs that are saying we have this body. And now we have all these frequencies because look how we communicate. Look at what's happened. And so just to be clear, whenever you say we have this body, you're talking about the energetic body? Yeah, our cellular body, energetic body. So it needs love too. You so know, are and the cellular body and the energetic body the same? Thing? They are the same. So people will use different terminology. Oh, you know, whenever mm-hmm. you would always say cellular, like I was thinking about my physical cells. Yeah, well, that's so it is, right? But it's also part of that's your energy system in your body. It's Does all connected. Sense? It's all connected. Yeah, so. Hmm. Um, yeah, so. I'm scanning myself now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. I mean, I think it's a great practice. Where, what are you feeling, Emily? What are you feeling in your no, body? Yeah. I, I keep I keep energy in my shoulders really bad. And I've been working a lot lately. I'm like just stretching them out. And David, if you were listening to this, you have a problem with this too, sir. But <laughs> and he knows he does too. We both store like, we store stress in You're our like shoulders. This. And David's gotten really bad. Like I sometimes I'm like, David, sit up. Just, just sit up, let it go. Um, but I've been, I've been doing a lot of yoga and like focusing on my shoulders lately because, um, because I hold a ton of stress in my shoulders and in my hips really, really bad. Yeah. So like for me doing yoga and stretching and like not even yoga, yoga, I'm a stretcher. Like one of the best things to learn from my grandmother, love her dearly. She's this cute little like 411 woman who's amazing. Whenever I was a kid, I remember her getting down into the floor after she'd come home from a long day at work, she worked at a nursing home. It was, like, very, like, very tiring work for her. And she would come home and she would lay in the floor and stretch. And it was something that she did every single day. And I always thought it was ridiculous. You know, I'm like this, like, six-year-old kid running around, like, watching my grandmother lay around on the floor. Um, but as I've gotten older, it's something that I do a lot now. Like, a whole lot now, and I love it. And just getting down and, like, and stretching. Just stretching it all out. Getting getting the stress and, like, shit out of your shoulders. <laughs> well, yeah. has done yeah. huge things for me being able to, one, sleep well. Because sleep, for me, and I've talked about this a couple of times, sleep for me, as a mom or not a mom, like, even in high school. <laughs> like, I was the girl who was always in bed, like, the earliest. And, um... Even now, I'm kind of concerned I get too much sleep sometimes. Like, I'm a hardcore sleeper. Um, But being able to get all of that energy that is stored in my joints and in my bones, like or out, um, has helped me sleep so much better and has helped me, like, focus a little bit better. And a couple episodes, Kathleen and I grilled each other on meditating a little bit. And so like even getting back to that recently, um, like my shoulders and my hips are looser than they have ever been. But if a day goes by where I'm not like stretching and mindfully getting it out, I can feel my shoulders like start moving towards my ears. Yeah. It's a thing that just happens. So my shoulders... I'm learning that, so another tool for your, everybody here is, um, is, and it's very opposite of what we think with being fresh mama body, like bodies, because we want to get our bodies back, right? And the more restorative, the more like slow therapeutic yoga you can do versus going back to your Bikram class or your core power class or any of those classes that are going to, what you think are going to be, get you back into your size six jeans. It's like, no, just turn that around. Let's turn that around for a a little bit. Because if you can take care of your shoulders, I did this little practice with a therapeutic yoga teacher last Friday by chance. And when she got, she got me on this, like, it's a piece of foam about an inch high, three inches wide and about probably three feet long. 
It's really like you would not think it would do anything. (laughs) (laughs) And so I laid on it for a little bit and we did these like grandma exercises where your arms slowly go over your head then they go down. I mean, like you're moving so slow that you're like, oh God, you know, like for me, (laughs) Miss High Energy Runner. Um, I'm like, really? And then she gets up. She's like, you're beaming, you know? And she's like, look at your shoulders. They dropped four inches. And I was like, oh my God. I went and looked in the mirror. And I was like, that's my body. Like, that's my normal, healthy, not jacked up body, do you know? And so those little things are super valuable that you can rub off it's onto other huge. people. Whenever we were on our trip, like in a tent and like, it was a very stressful trip for us. It was yeah. glorious and amazing and beautiful, but like we were in like halfway survival mode for a month and a half. Like it was pretty legit. And um, pretty much all I could do was I would get in the tent at night. Like when every day was out, like doing whatever Lily would run off and find some friends. I would get in the tent and do my stretching. I dropped 10 to 15 pounds. Wow. Like, and I mean, I was still eating like a hoss. Right. I mean, tons of energy <laughs> needed to do this. But like, I I have finally like gotten back down to my like pre-baby weight. And the most active I've been has been in the past three months. And stretching, like it's just huge. doing super restorative stuff. And like, I'm stronger than I've ever been. And like, really, I know Kathleen's going to be like, <laughs> Kathleen's so face right I'm now. Still, is I'm like, stuck on the so... ice eating like a hoss because like literally I saw you eat twice in like the week that you're staying at my house. <laughs> oh, it's so... because I had come off the road of eating Cheetos I'm and just French saying, fries every right. day. And like, we ate, we ate barbecue and bunless burgers and French fries across uh-huh. the entire country. Okay, like, Gwyneth Paltrow. <laughs> <laughs> I eat so much. <laughs> you guys, I do. I promise. Kathleen will throw it down though, hardcore. Yeah, I guess, We're I gonna have it. a like an eat off. I, I mean, I, I, I almost started a blog called "I Eat More Than Anyone I Know." <laughs> Because pretty much anyone you know, whatever they're eating, I'm eating double that. That's right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, okay, I want to talk the just blessing, a little bit more. The blessing of being 30, sorry. What? I said the blessing of being 30 something. <laughs> <laughs> just saying. Okay, um, well, and, you know, probably breastfeeding fired that up a little bit. Okay, so um, I want to just talk a little bit. Is there anything else that you. Whenever it comes to getting in a good, getting your brain organized, getting in a good mindset that you want to talk about before we move on to like habits and routines yep. for moms. I think one thing I'm just going to say generously is that therapy is okay. Like if you feel like you might be struggling with postpartum depression, go see a therapist. I was talking to my friend who helped edit the content for these cards I'm doing. And um, she's a, she's a PsyD or something, you know, so a psychologist. And she's also a client of mine two, two times over. And, um, and she's said, you know, helping women with, that are a little stuck with postpartum depression or if they have even major, she's like, it's such an easy fix. She's like, it's three months of therapy of someone who really knows how to take care of a woman's mental health. And you just get them in there, turn them around, help them with what it is and do it. And I really think that's one thing is if you feel like you're like, it, this is a tip. Like, because I think we, it's one of those places in our society where we're scared of being, even if it's mild, I'm just talking even like mild, like, you know, just anytime you are like, I just don't feel on center, on point, which I don't think many women do like a couple months of therapy. It's okay. Yeah. I was reading somewhere that, oh, maybe it was even your video for mother's little helper, which Mm -hmm. is, we'll share more on how you guys can get in touch with Rebecca and her exciting new product that she's about to launch on Kickstarter. But, um, that, what is it? 20% one in five women. Mm -hmm. It's gotta be more than that. Like, like that number actually offended me because I was like, I don't, I don't know a single mom who doesn't get depressed postpartum. So you have to understand with research, right? Like anytime you have a study that puts out a number, you're only able to collect so much data because people, the report, it's reportable. So that's what we kind of say more in the content on the page is that reportable is up to 20% of women of the, like per year will experience postpartum depression. And then how long is the postpartum, how, how long is that time frame? Like, so did you read that article on Goop? A few, like that says that now that you you said earlier today in our talk that it, I said that it lasts up to like three years, whatever. 
now there's a new article that shows has enough data from Australia or something like that that um, says that a postpart the postpartum period in a woman's life can be up to ten years. Okay, so Lily <laughs> and I can is send you the link to seven. that. <laughs> Emily, yeah. like, so if you get depressed, you could still be technically postpartum depressed. That would be, I mean, you know, that the, the as far as postpartum depression, probably no, that's more just like that wouldn't be diagnosed as postpartum depression, just as far as the body recovering from having a baby, period. Okay, so what about 18 months and I'm feeling sad? 18 months and feeling sad, I mean, they're, they're not going to clinically diagnose you as postpartum depression. They're just going to say maybe you have a little anxiety. That's it. You know, like, like as far as like what the DSM, which is the diagnostic manual for depression or for, for mental health, not depression, but for mental health, that would, that they would probably just say it's like an anxiety disorder or something, you know what I'm saying? So whatever it is that if it's anxiety, if it's mood, if it's, um, if it's, uh, OCD, like there's all sorts of different things and that's what's great. Yeah. I could, I mean, I could, I remember right thing. after I had Fox, I mean, he was probably two weeks old and I had him in his little sling and I was at my mom's house and I was like, I'm just feeling so good. I was like in that honeymoon Great. high phase. You were delirious. I was, <laughs> I was high and happy on birthing that baby. And my mom was like, well, you know, postpartum depression sometimes doesn't hit until six to nine weeks after having the baby. And I was like, what? Why would you say that to me? I'm mm -hmm. really so mad. And then six to nine weeks later, I was like, I'm sad. Totally. Yeah. It's transition, man. You know, like we can move on, but like, I think that's a lot of the work I do is honoring the transition, thinking of it more as a sacred, that sacred rite of passage, moving on to the, from, from, you know, maiden to mother. And if we look at it going maiden, mother, crone, you know, and when we switch over from maiden to mother, you know, and it's, it's, it's everything. It, it's everything. Cause it's your first major transition. It's beyond marriage. It's beyond all that kind of stuff. You grew a baby and then you birthed the baby. And then now you have to deal with that, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And like that transition's huge. And we just don't have in our, our preparation. We have more preparation now than we have in the last 20 years. And that's what I love about your work, Rebecca, is that a lot of people acknowledge, like there are so many books written on, how to take care of your baby and how to raise a baby. There are not a lot of books written on how to raise yourself as a new mom. There aren't a lot of manuals for that. I mean, there are. There are, like, a lot of books on parenting styles and that sort of thing, but um, I think that there's not as much acknowledgement because so much focus goes on the baby that you kind of forget, like, oh, wait, I'm new at this too. Like, this baby's new at life, but I'm new at being a mom. You're responsible for it. <laughs> oh, all right. What kind? Um, what kinds of habits and routines do you think would be beneficial for mom bosses? Mm -hmm. um, you know, one thing I love is for a, the best kind of straight sleep that you can do is setting your desired time to go to bed and wake up and commit to that time. That's something that really helps manage stress. So if you're going to go to bed at 10 and wake up at six every day, you do it every day, Monday through Friday. That's, and you stick to it, obviously, because clearly you're going to, as a new mom, you're going to be woken up. But let's say you're Emily and you have a six-year-old, still commit to, even if you need all that sleep, there's, it's a sleep training for your own, as an, for an adult, more I or less. I even on the weekend. I wake I up. I need that really bad. Yeah, try it. <laughs> try it. I've been, I've been trying it for the last month because, and then, you know, after two weeks, your body just starts doing it. You don't need the alarm yeah. clock or you don't need your watch or you don't need your phone to wake you up, you know, like your body just starts getting to a new circadian rhythm and you sleep better, you sleep harder and you just get it done. You, <laughs> you just get it done. <laughs> I guess you said done. that, yeah, you know, <laughs> get it done. Um, check slept, you know, um, so new moms, uh, I think, you know, the biggest thing is be graceful, like graceful with yourself, be patient with yourself. Uh, be uber loving to like to I'm closing my eyes for those of you that can't see my face I and mean, like feeling the place like your chest your heart like and being really love filled toward in that area when, when you're not you know so if you're because if you're struggling it's hard to feel love filled for yourself but you have to do it sort of like a badass trait so that's another it takes time um, clean eating is number two. So like, like scheduled sleep, regular sleep, clean eating is number two. And 
Everyone has a different philosophy of what that means because I eat clean, but I drink coffee, so that's fine. I've recently regulated how much I drink in alcohol so that I my nervous system would feel better because, um, A, I have a propensity to being an alcoholic in my family. I'm not. I've never been that way because I've been very regulated with it. But I definitely, especially in the summertime, I'm like, where's the rosé? It's a good, you know, like, like, or like whatever, <laughs> like a cocktail. But I, to, like, you know, one or t- two times a week isn't enough for me. Um, and some people have said that I have like the energy of seven people. So I really, you know, need to keep that down <laughs> at a mellower level. Um, so clean eating, you know, you can Google it. But I mean, if you want me to go into it, I can tell you how I see it. Yeah, tell um, us. Okay. So um, really limiting sugar, and I mean refined sugar. I was the person, the queen of having homemade baked cookies in my house all the time because I love them. And like Reese's Peanut Butter Cups, my favorite thing. But I tried experimenting with my diet again two years ago when I quit everything just to reboot. And I learned that sugar and I don't do great together. So I've eliminated a lot of sugar, which is really weird because sometimes I'm like craving it because I'm craving, craving protein. So when we're cra- our bodies are craving sugar, we're actually cra- needing to eat more protein in our diets. It's a tip. Um, mm-hmm. So I'm like, where's the chocolate? Where's the, you know, whatever. Especially if you're sleep deprived or it's huge. You know, hormonal. Mm-hmm. Um, it's easy to reach for. And so for me, even, even whenever you and I were working together, Rebecca, um, I don't eat a lot of refined sugar, but I was eating probably a hundred grams of sugar a day in dried apricots. Oh, I know that. I saw that the other day when you posted that and I was like, ah! <laughs> like an insane <laughs> amount of sugar That's insane. in dried fruit. So yep. just throwing that out there. Um, <laughs> it's so insane. <laughs> like your gut. I wonder what it was doing in there, that party. Um, it was turning so, it all into breast milk is what it was doing. And not not poop. <laughs> so, right. <I'm> sorry. <laughs> Let's just no, talk I was about- good. I was good. I've always been pretty good there. <laughs> good, good, good. Um, High five. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite tip for um, pregnant mamas is to like, I, I took this birthing class that was all about it was hypnobirthing and it was all about like breathing the baby out you know like breathing the baby down and out and so every time I would go to the bathroom I would I would breathe it out yeah <laughs> yeah that's a great training so, tip for, yeah. mom, for pregnant women. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. good good that is good um so then you know when your pelvic floor so I I don't I don't, I, I'm now starting to say to moms, give your body four months of rest after having a baby. So, um, and I mean, this applies because I think you have so many young mamas in your, in, in the boss population, you know, and that like, um, that if they are, especially these mamas to be like, if you can give yourself four months of doing this, like awesome little Emily stretches, we should get a video of Emily doing her little stretches in her house sometime. But like, <laughs> I which, thought about like in my future, there will probably be like an Emily, like restorative workout video that'd be great I can't wait to see it (laughs) um and but so um my brain just totally farted um pelvic floor pelvic floor so then yeah getting back into that exercise and when you are when you so if you have you know like your diastasis is back together and you only have like a one finger gap Okay, so what that is, is whenever you are pregnant, your abs are splitting apart because you're growing. And after you have the baby, a lot of times your abs do not come all the way back together. And you can feel your guts through your skin. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how's yours doing? Um, you know, it's funny, like, uh, even whenever you came down to Oklahoma, Rebecca, I was like, I'm good. And you were like, let me see. And it was like, you were tickling my organs. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, I'm probably actually still about the same, like, probably one or two fingers. Okay. Which isn't bad. One and, like, two- and it's closing up towards the top. Like, now it's, like, widest at, right at my belly button. Okay. And that's great. That's normal, most likely. And, and, um, and if it can get down to one over time, it will. But so after that four month mark and everything's back together and your pelvic floor feels somewhat strong, you might still pee a little, which you shouldn't. Um, then that's when you get into exercise where um, it's like you're being chased like a bear, you know? So you want to get out and move your hormones through your body through sweating at like three or four times a week. So that's another tip, you know? So um, is that you just have that 30 minutes four times a week doing something that makes you sweat enough that you actually detox, you know, like, and, and mostly you're going to be de- detoxing stress hormones. 
So that's why we exercise, even if we think we're doing it to lose weight and whatnot, we're doing it to get rid of stuff that's hanging on to us, you know? Yeah, and because so. earlier we were talking about, you know, your, your, it's not just your brain that hangs on to thoughts and emotions, but it's your body. There's a lot of intelligence in your body and those, I mean, I know that we're talking about it and it sounds kind of conceptual or theoretical that you can feel where the blockages in your body are or those gray areas, but you can work those things out of your body through sweating it out. Yeah. And, and just the medical term for that is, um, you know, like there's, uh, muscle testing and there's like, you know, biomechanics and there's, there's just like different words they have for doing the same kind of stuff now that makes it more medical and comfortable for the medical model to accept, you know, while I, like some of us though, on the other, uh, in the same that system are saying this, there's a cellular body. You know, and like there's this energetic body. And Emily's just laying on the floor stretching. I know. That's what they teach you, though. So, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I think those are, I mean, I, I mean, there's so many. I mean, my brain is really like a small encyclopedia of like what moms can do. But it, it's, it's just, you know, like there's so basic things of meditation, sleep, um, clean eating, once you're healed, exercising, and um, in, in a way, again, that makes you sweat, like, and, and, and then like, I had just recently, I had a client finish yesterday, and she's just like, I, and she had some weight to lose. And she said, um, I just was making excuses all the time to not take care of myself. And she's just like, I, and I needed extra support to like, take care of myself. And so whatever that looks like to you, you know, get support, whether it's like, cause someone wants to increase like their business, hire one of you guys for a coach or come to one of your, you know, like, like your work or come to the New Orleans event, like do something for yourself. That's an investment that takes you out of just your mother role and puts you into boss role or woman role or friend role or something different than just saying, this is the only thing for me, even though I know there's a lot of like love and pride in that, you know, it's kind of a push I do. I'm glad that you bring that up. One of our things that we are constantly encouraging our boss listeners to do is to tap their tribe and to build your creative wolf pack. Mm -hmm, And so it's important for moms too. So talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Um, well, gosh, it's so interesting. Cause I've always had a, I've always, I, I've always cultivated tr- wolf packs, <laughs> girl gangs, you know, and all, all over wherever I've gone. And, um, and that was a lot of how I started. Like, you know, I was definitely crushing hard on Seth Godin's concept of a tribe at the time. And at the time, a lot of people weren't using the word, tri- and this was only at the time, two years ago, people weren't using the word tribe as much as they are now. And like, now I see it everywhere. You know, I see it, on, especially when it comes to mom stuff, I'm always researching other people in the business and like for marketing reasons and all that kind of stuff. And I'm seeing mama tribe, this tribe, that tribe, you know, like all these people doing tribe stuff. And I'm like, cool, good consciousness is shifting, right? So um, motherhood, what we don't talk about when you're in your prenatal visits, because we're just like, this is great. We want you to have a healthy, safe birth. We don't say to you, once you have your baby, you're, you might face some like extreme alienation. You might be, you know, like the fact of the matter that you sit on the couch for half an hour feeding on one side of your boob or with a bottle or whatever it is, and you sit there and you're like, I know I have a meeting in 45 minutes, but I'm probably going to be late because this baby's doing whatever it's doing. And it, it takes time, right? So one way to like combat that alienation aspect, I mean, there's so many ways we can alienate each other from judging. Like the whole, like there was this huge breastfeeding judgment thing that went on on Instagram, I think like last summer where they were, you know, people were breastfeeding pictures and they removed pictures and then people, whatever, you know, there's all that kind of stuff. So I just think there's so many ways we alienate. And well, and, and bottle feeding mamas get it too now with I the know. breastfeeding movement being all, you know, like breast is best. Like it's I a know. great idea, but that can make women who can't yep. breastfeed feel really yep. bad. Yeah. So, yeah, I just, I, I just think that like the thing that's the hardest, the thing that women bump up against the most from you and you had this question earlier but like what do you see the most in your clients is and it's that that they that you remove yourself so much from what was normal um even if you already if you're on your second or third kid because adding another child to your life is uh, takes a lot of energy and it does a lot for you um 
that if there's anything you can do, it's just be really conscious and um, to say, like to put a note on your mirror in the bathroom that says, call your girlfriend, you know, like if you need something, like make a note to self, make a mantra, like do something and put it where you see it every day so that you start combating your own alienation and that we start joining in on other women. What I love about what you guys are creating, what I've, so many people from Oklahoma city have contacted me and been like, I saw Kathleen doing this. And it's like, introduced me to all these women in this area. And, you know, so women are starting to build their own groups, the village, like there's all these people on Instagram, you know, that are these little micro tribes everywhere. Um, and, and that's great because everyone is different. So, you know, I don't know if there's a, core answer but if we go back to the way our ancestors did it and that is coming together doing what you're doing with being boss and doing what I'm doing with the mother love it's like we're building these little tribes of people that eventually they connect in some ways because it's all connected and then we get bigger in mass when we come together because we're like oh let's bring the mother love together let's bring the you know being boss and then we have 6,000 people and then all those people have extra hundreds of people, you know what I'm saying? Right. So eventually like, we end up even being stronger. <laughs> back to just one on one, one of the things that um, I always loved about you, Rebecca, is you're like, pick up the damn phone. Yeah. So I'm, that's there's, it. <laughs> texting is super easy. And I have my mom and friends I text with. And one of them I was worried about, and I think maybe I was even talking to you about it, Rebecca, and you're like, call her. If mm-hmm. she doesn't pick up the phone, go to her house. And yep. I did, and it's huge. It's huge because it's easy to text someone and say, yeah, everything's good whenever things are not good. And yep. just even um, the physical face-to-face connection that you can have with other moms. But this is also with other bosses or other moms that are bosses. Or with your partner. Well, huge. Is really huge <laughs> there, too. Thank you, Emily. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, I, th- I think the, the sisterhood thing is important, you know, and you're right about the partner as well. There's one of the cards and it was just came from a blog post, but last year my friend came over and she and her husband were having a time, you know, and, um, she came over and she was just, I mean, sheets of tears, you know, second, her kids are toddlers and she's got two of them and they just all, they're bust ass Midwesterners, you know, and, um, she just was crying, crying. I made her Indian food. I got her drunk. <laughs> and then I was like, and then I like must have turned on, I don't know, maybe either Lady Gaga or, you know, Ellie Goulding or something. And I was like, get up. And she's like, what? Cause I know she loved to dance. Right. And I, I was like, get up and dance. And, and then we, and then the next day she sent me this blog post cause she just like shook it out. And I think it was Taylor Swift exactly who played for her. <laughs> so anyways, and, um, and, uh, and so we came up with like, I think I wrote a blog post about it, but it was like the, you know, like being a mom's hard. They don't tell you that shit period. You know, like doctors, midwives, we don't tell you that being a mom. I mean, you know it before you have a baby, but it's hard. It's going to be hard in different ways for everybody. So be the friend who does something for your girlfriend. And that's like, bring him a drink bring them, make, make an awesome cocktail, Emily. Like, you know, I'm always wanting your cocktails and, you know, or bring them a latte, bring them a smoothie and then like get them to move their body, do something different. Like that's a tool that you can do for your friends, you know, same with your partner. Like, I don't know, whatever makes him or her, you know, just, yeah. So I think are we like, I think that, yeah, I don't, I think you just have to reach out and you're right. I'm, I'm, I'm also of the generation that still calls people. But I also, a lot of moms that are my age, um, they've gotten into the texting realm. And it's actually annoying to me that I can't talk to my friends anymore. You know, when everyone's phone is right next to them all the time and I just want to, like, five minutes, you know, um, or whatever it is. But you know what's cool about texting is that literally if you called me, I would have you know, Fox or whoever, like, pulling at me, right? But if you text me, I can read it, I can really hear it, and then I can respond to it on my own timeline. So, like, that's, you know, there's pros and cons to both of it, but, um... But when you're feeling a friend struggling like that, like, you again, you... Go to their house. Go to their house. Do something for them that says, get out of your head and into your body. I mean, if anyone could take anything away from this, it's, it's a lot of my work is get out of your head and into your body because our heads are exhausting. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> <laughs> what about, um, what, what, okay. So here's what I'm going to talk about a little bit is actually being a mom and a boss, because I feel like people are always telling me to slow down and it, 
pisses me off. Great. Awesome. Do you get I'm that really, does. Do, does anyone ever tell you to slow down? And you're homeschooling, so like you really are. Right. Everything is going <laughs> I think people have stopped trying to tell me to slow down. Like at this at this point, they just know that Emily's gonna do it, so just don't need to say anything. Um, but definitely whenever I was a new mom, I don't know. I guess what I do has always been so far removed from what people expect that they don't even like it doesn't even register as like doing things. I don't know. Not really. I just I think not. it's like condescending and sexist whenever people say to slow down. And I know it's well meaning, but it's not fair. No, I don't think it's about slowing down. I think it's about organizing. Right. I, and so I kind agree. of setting some boundaries. So yeah. what do you think about that, Rebecca? What like what do you think about getting organized or setting boundaries around being a mom and being a boss. Huge. Like I'm like, I'm totally jiving on the same page, you know? Um, I, it's another piece delegation is huge in the work I do. And it's, and also using a, a calendar. I have retrained myself that way. And I watched my mom, she became a lawyer at 42. And, you know, so I watched her go from running a nonprofit daycare center so she could hang out with us to, I mean, she always was in boss mode, period. And she is like, she should be the, like the mascot (laughs) of the being boss tribe because (laughs) it's what we all want to be when we're, you know, 68 years old, 69 years old almost. And, um, she would come home, you know, be our mom, do all that kind of stuff. We would be in, get in, you know, get in bed at nine, let's say. And then she would be up and out of the house by six o'clock because the way mediations work, we lived out, we lived 45 minutes away from the cities, like all that kind of stuff, you know? So she just was always going and she never, she still was a a good, a great mom, you know? And so I think there's that thing of like, if you want to do something as far as in your career that is high powered, high mojo, because you're passionate about it and you love it, you've got to be able to do that thing because you are still you. Your identity still is the most important thing because if your identity isn't intact and big and wholehearted and loving, then your kid is going to learn from that. And that brain development, they're going to be like, my mama's badass, you know? And I want to do cool shit like that too. Or same with my daddy is too, you know, because usually those kind of couples are attracted to each other. But they're going to they're gonna see that habit and see that work is good and then they're going to really enjoy their career later on in life versus seeing the parents who come home and they're like, yeah, it was a bitch of a day, you know, and that was a hard day and or I hate my job, you know, like those kind of things. They also learn that pattern and behavior and they're like, I had a friend of mine's son say to me once, like, this, I was working uh, even when I was visiting them and he's just like, why are you always working, Buck? You know, and I was just like, because I love what I do. And, and he was just like, huh. You know, kind of like, huh, okay. You know, like, wasn't sure, like, that was different than what he had seen a bit. And um, so um, we, we help set those patterns. So I just think there's that piece of if you're going to lose sleep, if you're going to, if you want to charge after something, you've got to do it. You obviously need to schedule, delegate, and have a partner that supports you in your actions because there's going to be resentment and grief if you don't. Talk about it ahead of time or early. Does I mean, maybe that's, again, I do this weird snaking conversation thing. So if that feels like you guys are understanding, <laughs> I hope so. But, um, uh, no, it snaked back very well. I think that's, I think that's really huge. I think having, um, having a partner who doesn't resent you for what you do, especially because I feel like a lot of people who work from home, if their partner does not, they think that they are a stay at home mom and then they should be like, cleaning and have dinner ready and like on some level like prepare for your family but um a lot of times there can be that sort of misstep between I'm a work at home mom and I'm a stay at home mom there's because there's a huge difference there um I think setting some boundaries there is like one of the first and foremost things you can do and like in that like tight home (laughs) home life creation where you are saying like I'm a mom and I'm staying at home to work on my business so that you can do both and then having a partner who won't resent you and who understands your role in that place in life um, is super important on <laughs> on many levels. And delegating. If you need help, this is something that we've talked about a lot of times. Whenever I was building my business, um, I stayed home with Lily. And uh, whenever I was really, like, 
kickstarting like the web design stuff and really building what I have now, I had someone come into the house and work. Um, she would come and like hang out with Lily for a couple of hours a week. Um, being able to delegate a little bit of playtime and like putting her down for a nap sometimes so that I could, you know, go into boss mode and work. That's if you have a baby having... that takes naps. Oh my god. I want to I want a screenshot that should be on. <laughs> <laughs> or or even if she wasn't taking a nap because she hasn't always slept perfectly. <laughs> Though she definitely does. I know how lucky I am. Like I have a kid who has my like love of sleep and like I love that about her. Um, but she's not always sleeping. Like she's definitely awake a lot too. And we used to have, I used to have a girl come in and help me at home so that I could be a stay at home mom or a work at home mom. And then I would also be able to cook and like do things like you, there's only one of you. If you need help, get, get it. it. There's nothing wrong with that. Totally. And I, oh, go ahead. I was just gonna say, I'm on the same page of if you have the, uh, flexible income, to hire cleaning people, um, hire, you know, like hire who you can hire to like, just not, so you can just do your work and you can be a mom, you know, and take away, cause you're always going to be tidying up the house at the end of the day, no matter what, but to do the deep cleaning stuff, that should be off your, like, if you can afford it, that should be off your plate. And if not, then that's where you sit down with your partner and say, okay, what do we need to do to make an extra 60 bucks a month, depending on where you live to get your house cleaned? You know, I mean, it just uh, is like the, it means everything to some people. So those little things. One thing that was huge um, in the early postpartum days for me and Jeremy is that one, he took five, five weeks off of work to kind of have some paternity leave with me. And that was monumental. Whenever he went back at six weeks, I called him and I said, come back home. Like, I need you to come back home for another week. <laughs> so he, he stayed at home for another week. So it was six weeks total. Um, and during that time, he was, he was working, but he was also working on his master's. And he thought that, he would, that would be a good time to write his thesis in that six weeks. And that did not happen. I think I remember laughing at you whenever you told me that Jeremy was going to do that. Well, I think the plan was, and so that's whenever, that's actually whenever you laughed at me was before I ever even got pregnant. And I was like, oh, I'm was. thinking yep. about having a baby at the same time that Jeremy goes to get his master's degree because then he'll be home all the time. And so yep. thinking, and that was still thinking from the work from home model that the baby would stay home with both of us. We kind of split our time. Um, and we, we've talked about this before on the show. Daycare was my solution with actually Rebecca's help. That's before we ever worked together. Rebecca sent me the nicest email to kind of help alleviate some of that mom guilt that comes with daycare. And now that's so far behind me. I'm like, why did I ever even feel bad about that? But, um, anyway, so having him home for those first six weeks, just having his support alone was huge. And, and I don't take it for granted that I have a husband that is so 50, 50, whenever it comes to the baby, but all of that said, Oh, and, and just to finish the story about the thesis, none of it happened during those yeah. six weeks. None of yeah. it. But, um, so he was able to see how hard it is, even even thinking back to those first six weeks. Now I'm like, that was nothing. The baby's yeah. just kind of hanging out. Yeah. But um, anyway. Can I add a resource? Yeah, name? yeah. Like there's a book by, Brid I think her name's Bridget Schulte or something, but it's called Overwhelmed. And then it has a bunch of other like subtitles. And it's a great book on delegation and boundaries and all that kind of stuff. And really like a tool for moms and dads, really, or partners you know, so moms and moms, dads and dads, like everybody. And it just really talks about even delegation to the level of saying, you do the bed making this day or this week, and then you do the, like the garbage taking out or whatever, you know? And, um, and if you do the beds and you put the pillows in the wrong order for me, the OCD woman, I won't touch them and correct your work. And if I take out the trash wrong and put it like outside the can versus inside the can because I'm too busy and spaced out and sleep deprived, you won't, <laughs> unless we don't want raccoons, you know what I'm saying? Like, so you like, you don't correct each other's work um, and you just accept that we do things differently. And that, I mean, is what falling into parenthood is kind of about. Yeah, I will say that's like huge in parenting too. I, I think that it's, okay, so this is something I want to talk about actually, is that even so I'm super lucky, I guess. I think I just chose right to 
procreate with an amazing man. But um, I'm, I'd I'm say super you both lucky, seem that, lucky. <laughs> that, yeah, and David and Emily, like you guys are That's a whole other channel. I mean, yeah. awesome. <laughs> so awesome. anyway, we're, we're lucky and we're um, privileged to be in partnerships. So we're speaking to our experience here. Um, but I would say even with things feeling really split 50, 50 chore wise and parenting wise, there's still this like energetic, I almost want to say burden for lack of better word, um, on the mom. And so in the middle of the night, even though Jeremy and I are working the same amount of hours in the middle of the night, whenever the baby wakes up crying, who does he want? Who do you think? Trick question. Maybe it's Me? not a trick question. Yeah. Who do you think he wants in, whenever he wakes up in the middle of the night crying? I think that really like at a, when the baby is dependent on a mother for breast milk, the baby wants the mother to be nurtured and to be fed or, you know, whatever. If someone's not breastfeeding and they're bottle feeding, I think it is a change up. Like it's a rotation. It is literally, and and I'm just like, I'm just, that's my, I don't, I think that we, too, we mom, we mama bear it. I think that's a Kathleen mindset. I think the baby wants a mom, but do you think I'm projecting that? Do you think I'm projecting that he wants me? I think, I I think a little bit, like, I remember whenever I had Lily, I, uh, I could not breastfeed 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 for more than six weeks (laughs) so like I had to um I had to we did bottle and David and I switched like we rotated if if I got up last time he got up the next step last night Lily woke up in the middle of the night with a nightmare which so rarely happens David got up maybe it's like the moon maybe it's this blue moon maybe I told Mikey last night it was going to be a crazy moon it is proof that's a good one. It's a big one. All right. So the other night, Jeremy, the baby wakes up and Jeremy goes in to get him. Fox is standing at the crib and he starts sh- He sees Jeremy and starts shaking his head. No. Yeah. You've trained him. You've yeah. trained I him the have other way. Not. Just saying. <laughs> actually, actually, that's so funny. Lily, and may- maybe this is like a daddy daughter thing, but there was, there was a time in her like toddlerhood where she would wake up in the middle of the night and call for David. Like, she wasn't calling for me. That is, like, my wet and dream. I loved it. I loved I know. it so much. <laughs> you are still, you still have a baby under two, Kathleen. Remember this. Like, that's yeah. where, uh, like, gr- yeah, you're, you're, you train your child. Like, at this point, and all of you, like, every single one of you, if you want to be a boss and be a mom, you have to step into that boss role of you are the mom. You are the parent. You train and dictate. And, like, you that you have all the power in your household, you and your partner. And if you're sharing it, then, like, the two of you are a force to be reckoned with. Like, the fact it's us that... us against the baby. Well, and is. I think it's this is where, like, yes, please comes in great. You know, I think that Amy Poehler's book comes in great because she is a boss mom and she is like has yeah. really big boundaries with the way she parented, you know, and yeah. she, of course she can afford massive amount of help, all that kind of stuff. But I'm, you know, like, I, I don't know. It's it. I, I agree with what you're saying on many levels, Emily, because it is it, uh, some of my biggest lessons have come from lesbian couples and this year, in the last few years about parenting, because I've asked everyone, like, how do you manage the night? And, um, one great tip I heard was that the non-birthing partner got up and would get the baby when he was, this is immediate, like first eight months postpartum, um, you know, get up, get the baby, change the diaper, bring him to mom for nursing. The nursing mom never got out of bed. Like we, I think we talked about this, Kathleen. Um, and then, um, and then if baby fell asleep, fell asleep, but otherwise it was then the non-birthing partner's responsibility to take the baby back. I mean, these people were choosing to have the baby in their bed in separate rooms, you know, so you're going to choose to be the parent you want to be right. But at that point, I, I think part, like that it's, it's that innate, like my mom says that she uses the words like ergotrate. Like, so she uses the old school words for like what would be called Pitocin these days. <laughs> like she was, you know, she's like, instead of giving a shot of like, you know, Pitocin, she's like, they gave us a shot of guilt at birth, you know? And she's, my mom oh. is, you know, she's Cajun. She's like spicy and has this thing. And she's like, yeah, you know, you just get this shot where like, no matter what happens, like you might feel guilty even if the outcome's good for your kid, you know, just because 
whatever. So we just, if just. Can we talk about mom guilt? Like we can try. I can do my best. What do you, what... <laughs> anyway, I think that I think that like probably one of the hardest things um, for moms, and I think that this is about setting some energetic boundaries, is that there's this mom guilt, like that you're not doing anything well. You know that you can't do your job well or be a mom well. Um, I don't know. Maybe maybe we shouldn't go there. It might be too. You much. got a shot of mom guilt. I think it's it's what you did, and we all do. Like I think the reality is, is we do. And Emily, you have a re- like. So, I love talking to you about motherhood because you look okay, at my mom Southern. Um, I live in the north, where in the north, like I've lived in the north, I've lived in the Pacific Northwest, I've lived in the west, I've lived in the east. You know, I've lived sort of everywhere. And the uh, my since my mama is from the deep south, like it's a whole different ball of wax, you know. And um, and so I sort of like this, like this is just we have birthed this child into our lives, and you know, so if he gets up and he's like, no, I don't want like, and you know, Jeremy comes back into bed and he's like, he wants you. So then, like, so then just being <laughs> confident enough to say. No, I'm just going to stay here. I mean, like, there's going to be heartstrings that are going to be pulled when you, like, want to go make him stop. And, like, unless he's going to, like, stop. We don't want to, like, you know, like, you, if he doesn't stop crying, of course you're going to go in there and, like, snuggle with him. But I don't know. Like, I think that one's a hard one that you guys have to work out. But, I mean, there might be a little training in there that you can untrain. Everything's malleable. Remember that. Like, nothing is forever. Yeah. Yeah, he's a young, growing brain. You'll, <laughs> you can range, retrain that however you want. No, I think um, I think Southern moms, there's definitely something there. Like, my mom was, my mom taught me crazy things, like good things that, like, I definitely, like, carry over and teach my kid. Like, my kid in public places is quiet and still. <laughs> and whenever whenever I am working, she knows not to interrupt. And it's it makes her happier, too. Like, having those boundaries, if you want to, like talk about boundaries and being a new mom and being a boss, like they are absolutely necessary. And it's that consistency with boundaries that will be everything. And it doesn't matter if you're sleep deprived and tired. It doesn't matter if you're hungry. It doesn't matter if you like, if you just want to walk away, that consistency is everything in both like raising your child and growing your business. Like I talk about consistency in business all the time. It's the same thing. Like you are investing your everything into raising a good child and like it requires that consistency and and like forethought and planning and taking care of yourself for you to be able to do it in any way that's going to you know create a child that's self-sufficient and also will hopefully have an impact on the world doing what you love is part of that like I think us as creative entrepreneurs hold so much power over the next generation and being able to show them that you can literally do anything that you want. You can make a life for yourself and your family doing whatever you choose to do um, is so powerful. And like, if you can interject the same lessons that we put into like our business practices that build badass businesses that support us into your child, then you're going to have a badass child that's going to support you when you're old and gray too. Totally. And I think like it's something when we're talking about mama guilt. So it's like when we're saying these things, these are two people's views. I mean, I think they're solid views because I'm uh, consistency is something, as you remember, it's something I talk about with everything. If you want to make change in your diet, in your body, like any of that kind of stuff, you have to be consistent with your practices, period. It's like what changes the neuro psychology of your body. Does that make sense? Yeah. <laughs> it's a little bit big. But, um, but, um, to also not feel bad if you believe differently. It goes back to that kind of, you know, the stuff we were talking about earlier where it's like where we start alienating people because we have different beliefs. But I think consistency is not a, it's a very loving encouragement to like be saying to people like this is what will help you feel better over time. And that over time piece is really important because what I learned from, you know, and you guys saw me through some major shifts in my business and it, and you saw how it affected my, like my whole being specifically my mental health. And cause it was unexpected, but it was with consistent measurement and action, like in, at the pace I needed to go at to start doing something that I feel is completely right to be doing. Um, so, you know, you got to be careful for what you wish for, right? 
because I have such an awesome loyal list and group gathering community of women that follow the mother love that in like last January or like in the winter time, I started saying, oh, so I'm going to reduce the amount of like private clients I'm taking. And I was just like, oh shit, that's my bread and butter. Right. But people listen to me. Like they say on a newsletter list, like your tribe will listen to you if they love you and they will say, you know, so whatever. So over time, it, right around that same time, I decided to start making this little mother's helper. And, um, uh, which is that it's like a self care kit, some, a deck of, cards i could totally give you the spiel it's so <laughs> it's Do so it. funny it's I it. I it. my it. head i've heard a little bit but i need to yeah i know so i mean like you know it's funny because so much is like i've been like learning so much about marketing in the last month but so anyways so i was on an airplane i was reading i had about a stack of eight papers on postpartum mental health postpartum health all that kind of stuff just very heavy p- papers and I got through like number two and number two is about a research project that went on in inner city Chicago where there was this very cool birth center. I was just like, and as I was reading, it's like, Oh, Kathleen would have loved birthing at this place. Like it just looked like a very <laughs> like diverse group of people, including like white to Latina, you know, like just big group of population and midwives, doctors, acupuncturists, you're like, you're just not getting a lot of care like this, but for low income women to be getting this kind of care is exceptional in our system. So anyways, this paper says then that that everyone in the practice gets its self care kit when they go home at six weeks postpartum. And those women who receive a self care kit are, you know, like whatever percent, like a, a, a huge, like I think it was somewhere around 50 or 60% more likely to return to the clinic for mental health disorders, physical health disorders, or even emotional health or spiritual health disorders. Like because that, because they were embracing a wide practice, they could go there for any kind of care. You know, so that where we have this situation where 20% of women are diagnosed with postpartum depression every year in our country, but there's this other 80% of women who are out there saying, what do I have for a resource to take care of myself and might have postpartum depression, like a percentage of that, you know what I'm saying? We don't know all the numbers of women that are missed. A hundred percent. A hundred percent of women have (laughs) postpartum depression. (laughs) Um, So given these self-care kits, you know, like we can do better. And I read that self-care kit and I was like, ah, oh, that's it. You know what I'm saying? Like it was like light, I will say lightning moment, you know, from Adam Braun, how he talks about this lightning moment. And I was like, I looked at my mom, we were on the airplane together to go see my family. And I looked at her, I was like, I'm going to make self-care kit. She's like, okay, <laughs> roll her eyes, <laughs> like, you know, and I spent the, I mean, I just hit it and I had so much content already written from a year and a half of blogging and writing newsletters that I could scour through what I had put it into a big, you know, outline more or less. Then I literally got like a little cool, you know, artistic notebook and like started making like grid notebook and started making uh, cards that like just the first draft of what the cards would look like. And I had, you know, body, mind, heart, and soul, like the four areas that I work on. And I just started moving stuff around and went from having, you know, a 25 page, piece of paper filled with shit and to like a very dialed down, easy to read, awesome, like deck of cards, almost like a tarot deck of cards. Cause I'm like on Instagram, all these mamas have these tarot deck of cards. I'm like, let's make some tarot cards that are about your health, you know? So so you can flip to them. And so, um, then, you know, I love Danielle Laporte most of the time. And, um, (laughs) and, (laughs) I Sorry, I can't hold the lot. I know. <laughs> it's so perfect. I, <laughs> namaste. Um, and so uh, she, with those truth bombs that came out, I was like, okay. And they can look fucking awesome. You know, like they can be beautiful. And so after working with all you guys out of state for this project, I was like, I'm going to do an in-state project because they have all these resources right here. And for me, this felt so close to home. I wanted to be able to work in the house or in the office with these people, which has been, which is, I think this is great that we can do what we can do because I got such amazing stuff from both of you, but to do this has just been like made me come home. And as you know, with like a lot of my work, when I wrap up with clients, I talk about this whole coming home concept of like what it feels like to come home in your body. And I needed to do this full circle cycle in my own life at like 38 years old, where I had to come home after losing my dad 
after losing a love of my life, like, I mean, like all to death, not just like losing them because they like skipped out of life, you know, it's like because they died and I needed to like come home and get healthy again, you know? So working, I know that's tangential, but it applies to working with these designers has been cool. So the cards are, well, so I just want to jump in and say that, I mean, we talk a lot about working styles and there, it is so easy to re- work remote now with people that there is something to be said about being in a physical space with someone and collaborating and just really, you almost feel like you can get your hands dirty and there are um, things like nuances and, and things that happen when we are in a physical space with someone that does not happen even over the phone or over Skype. Um, so even whenever Emily was in Oklahoma City recently, I mean, I wish that we had more of that. Like, there's just something about being, so that's just a kind of a boss tip. Like, just the same way that you're like, pick up your phone or go to your girlfriend's house, like get in the same space with your team or with another creative peer, because big things can happen whenever you're in the same physical space. So you guys got in the same physical space, you made these cards. Now what? Well, I just got shivers. I got goosebumps. So I have to say for all like the, the, all the being boss crowd that's coming to New Orleans, like I just see like so many little things happening. Yes. Like, like you know, because I, I know some women in Ohio who are like, should I meet up with this person? I was like, yeah, like it, A, it's just a friend, you know, but you speak the same language. You don't have, you won't have to interpret and your conversations will be magnetic. And that's like, it, you guys are going to, it's like awesome. It's going to blow people's minds. Um, so the so yeah so with the cards and I was like well everyone's on their phone you have to build an app you know so I started when I was at Danielle Laporte I found her then she had her app person Lindsay and I was just like I'm just gonna email oh actually somebody else that we know um had referred had told me about Lindsay because they were friends and then so she never made the introduction so I just introduced myself and said you know your friend knows me and da 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 and she was like great you know so we are building this deck of cards. We are building this app. Actually, we're not building it yet. That's why we're doing Kickstarter. But what we've done is designed the base and the foundation for it. All the content is done. I'm blessed to have an editor who works for Oxford University Press, which is all medical texts. So she's and I have worked together on editing the whole deck of cards, which I mean, so it's been like when you when the, when the universe... When you want to do something or you get an idea and the universe in your body and in your mind is like, yeah, you know what I'm saying? It's like, yes, or yes, like says it really soft. You got to go with it no matter how impossible it feels like period. And that's my boss tip, I think for the, like this call, because that yes. And I'm like my friend and I used to text Y E U S. Cause it's like that. Yes. You know, <laughs> it's like that guttural. <laughs> yes. And like, um, uh, Uh, that yes has to be completed like that has to be completed because the universe will like because the humans on this planet your children us their grand your grandchildren their great-grandchildren we will all be better because of that yes in some way or another does that make sense And, Amen. and like my, my armpits are I know, sweating. Me too. Okay, so how can so so do you imagine every single mom coming home from the hospital with this deck of cards? Yes. Like is that what the yes. is that the goal? Yes. 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 Every yes. single birth. So like yes, yeah. Cards. Yeah. So the second person I talked to about this was a hospital in Minneapolis. Oh nice. and I I went and talked to the director of women's services. They have this pish posh awesome like women's health clinic where you walk and you're like whoa where am I on another planet <laughs> <laughs> you know and I said this is what I want to make and I also so the app has like many layers to it the first letter the first layer is translating the graphics which are just badass and then um and then the second so that the kickstarter campaign we're like we're asking to be funded for thirty thousand dollars that is baseline graphic design, app design, printing, basically, you know? So if we raise more than $30, well, when we raise more than $30 or $30,000, then we build in a community function and a get your questions answered function, and then potentially build on a function where you can have like a scan code and get connected to 
a 24-7 provider that can answer your immediate postpartum questions if you feel like you're in a struggling kind of crisis, big question mode, and you don't want to go to what to expect, or you don't want to go to Dr. Google, or you don't want to go to the internet, but you really want to talk to a person, and you want an answer that fits your beliefs, you know? So that's big, that's big blue sky thinking. Um, but, uh, so yeah, every mom would go home with it or moms would be like, oh, yay, there's little mother's helper. And let's, I'm going to get that for every mom for her, you know, her shower gift, because, you know, you go from this period where it's all about you and then you have the baby and you know, it turns all about the baby and you just feel like this, like, Hey, I'm still here. It's still about me. You know, I have this personal rule that whenever I'm talking to people who have new babies, I will not ask about the baby. Yeah. Like, that, that is, like, a personal rule. I don't do it. I will ask all about them and what they're doing. And, like, if it comes up towards the end of the conversation, but I don't talk to new moms about their babies. Yes, that's it. <laughs> I, 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 I mean, I'll ask, like, you know, the my midwife brain comes out and I'm like, how are they pooping? <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> but like, but, uh, you know, I, I will, I will keep it mom focused. I've always have, and I don't feel selfish for that. I don't feel because people are like, why are you a midwife? And I'm, I got in it for women. I did not get in it for the babies. I love them. I love children and I love babies, but I got in it to make moms feel strong and empowered, you know? So Rebecca, where can people learn more about you and where can they support the Kickstarter? Yeah. So my website, so www.rebeccaegbert.com. Get on the news list or like newsletter list. I think it's the great one. Um, that's me being totally like, that's, I love my newsletter. It is great. It is very <laughs> Like, great. I love it. Um, I have fun writing it. Um, and then www.littlemothershelper is live right now and you can sign up for a newsletter there which we don't have a blog yet to it because it's all just pre-kickstarter all that stuff will build built out eventually but the website is like basically ready um the kickstarter campaign goes live so on the 5th august well, so this 5th. is so actually this is, airing right so it is live now okay so that's right so the kickstarter campaign is live now <laughs> and when does it when does it end it ends on, let me check real quick, because like right the Friday before Labor Day. So I think that is September 4th at 9 a.m. So we do the last 48 hours, the last push, as we're calling it, will be um, starting on the 2nd, 3rd, and then ending the 4th at 9 a.m. So those are the first 48 hours and the last 48 hours are really like where we ask, we're asking everybody to put on their pom-poms and loudspeakers and just say, let's, let's, let's change the game for the way women are cared for after they have a baby, since there's not a lot of care, period. If you like being boss, be sure to sign up for our newsletter at lovebeingboss.com, where you'll get episode worksheets, secret content, and other goodies delivered straight to your inbox every week. Again, that's lovebeingboss.com. Do the work, be boss, and we'll see you next week. Yeah, we'll include all sorts of links um, so that everyone knows how to connect with you and everything that you're doing. Thank you so much for joining us today. It was a blast. Thank you for jamming. It was fun. <laughs> it was fun. Sweaty armpits and all. <laughs> I know. I always <laughs> leave these really sweaty. I'm glad it's not just me. It's I'm just... already sweaty and stinky from boxing. All right. Well, let's all go take showers now. I was just going to say, go take a shower.